Lord, we just thank you so much uh, for who you are. We thank you for all that you've done, um, all that you continue to do in our lives and through our lives, and all that you've promised to do, and that you'll carry us to completion. And Lord, what better way to spend the next uh, 45 minutes just studying your word and just, uh, I'm so thankful just that the volume of the book speaks of you. We just ask just that you would, um, you would throw out all distractions and uh, things that we just get caught up in life right now and just let our focus be on you. Uh, thank you so much for your word. We just want to enter into this time as one who has found a great treasure because we know that we are going to find it. We love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, 1 Kings chapter 11. Um, so we're going to start in verse 26, and that's obviously at the end of the chapter, so I got I to gotta give you the context of what happens before. In 1 Kings chapter 11, um, if your Bible has those nice little headings, it'll tell you that Solomon's heart has turned from the Lord, which you're like, wow. It's a heavy-hitting section of Scripture, which is very true. Um, you know, it begins with Solomon loved many foreign women um, and that he clung to them in love. And it was specifically women from the nation that the Lord specifically said, you shall not, you know, give yourself to marriage unto them because they will turn your heart away from the Lord. And, um, you know, God's word is always faithful, always true, and... That's what happens to Solomon, um, which is a very sad testimony because, you know, I think Solomon um, was probably the king best equipped to follow after the law. You know, early on in his, his reign, I think it's uh, in his first three years, he has that meeting with the Lord, and the Lord says, I'll give you whatever you want. And he says, oh, that I would have wisdom to rule this people. Which, you know, if you look more closely, he's, what he's essentially asking for is skill as a king. And he's like, I want skill to rule that. And the Lord goes, you know, that's an awesome thing. Um, I'm going to bless you with that. I'll bless you with peace from all your enemies. And, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you length, lengthened days if you walk in my in my precepts, just as your father walked. And uh, not only that, the Lord reveals himself again as Solomon is building the temple. He has two uh, very intimate times to where the Lord speaks to him, but yet his heart still turns. And not only does his heart turn just in the sense of worship, I mean, when we think of Solomon and his great achievement, yeah, the wisdom's up there, but that's not really his achievement because God gave it to him. That's God's achievement. Solomon's big achievement is that he built the temple, right? But here in chapter 11, we see that he's building high places for these false gods. He's building temples for them. And it's just like, Solomon, what are you doing? Um, I also just bring up a couple other portions of scripture. Um, in Exodus 32, if you guys are familiar with, uh, that is when um, Moses is up on the mountain getting the, the Ten Commandments, and the people, like, I always wonder how long Moses actually was gone before they were like, okay, he's not coming back. Aaron, make us false gods. Because it's just, it's totally just bewildering. But the people do that. They go, Aaron, Moses is gone. We don't know what's happened to him. Um, come make us some gods. And then Aaron goes, no, you knuckle. No, he actually consents. And he, he goes, okay, give me all your gold. And he makes two golden calves. And he goes, okay, guys, behold, your gods who delivered you from Egypt. And then Moses comes down. It's a big mess. Um, so we see that the nation of Israel has already had a heart that's prone to do that. And not only do they have that instance, but they have uh, in Numbers 25, this is right after um, Balaam, you know, he comes with his donkey and he prophesies over the nation and he's, you know, he, he tells B King Balak how to, uh, how to get the nation of Israel entangled because really Balak was seeking the destruction of the nation. So in Numbers 25, the people, you know, enter into these foreign, um, foreign marriages too and their hearts are turned and they begin idol worshiping and it again becomes a thing. I bring these things up because Solomon is like this and I also bring it up because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you don't have to turn there. This is just a very long introduction. I'm very sorry, <laughs> but I'm not sorry at the same time. Um, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes 
on the account of both Exodus 32 and 25, and he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the sea, uh, were under the cloud, and they passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So right there, like Solomon is closer to that than obviously we are right now. So Solomon knows the history of the people. In fact, he has his own handwritten copy of the law of Genesis through Deuteronomy. Um, I have, you know, I have like five different Bibles. Uh, None of them are handwritten by me, mainly because I wouldn't be able to read my handwriting. Um, But, you know, as I write my notes up here, as I write them, like this is like the fourth or fifth iteration they're into, like I have these memorized up here. I mainly have my notes because Matt says he doesn't trust anybody that does not teach from their notes. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, writing the word of God, studying it day and night, Solomon knew these things. And not only that, he's the wisest man to, to be on the face of the earth at this time. There has to be a retention of this history too. But yet he went in the same way. And the thing is, that can be our tendency too. It's, I mean, Solomon's the wisest guy in the, the, the entire world history, apart from Jesus Christ. And he did not live in a manner that pleased the Lord. Uh, I am certainly not the most most wise guy to ever live, because I don't even think that was a grammatically correct sentence. Um, I know my heart's tendency is simply to cling to things in love, to be like the Israelites. I mean, that's that's the entire thing with the Old Testament, is you can go through the history of Israel, and you can be like, what are these guys doing? And at some point, the Lord is going to use their foolishness to be like, this is also your foolishness. (laughs) Um, So I say that as we're studying this, we have this as a backdrop to which we know that we can have these tendencies too. These guys are our examples. And the example we're specifically looking at tonight is King Jeroboam. I'm giving you all this context to see how Jeroboam is going to come in. So even even to, to further give give you like the, 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 um, the like stage entrance for Jeroboam's arrival in 1 Kings 11 verses 9 through 11. So the Lord became angry. Oh, I just touched this. I'm sorry. Uh, so the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. So I told you it's going to be Jeroboam. We jump down to verse 26 where we'll start tonight. Then Solomon's servant Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from Zareda, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. So here comes our buddy Jeroboam. Um, Not to be confused with Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Uh, It's really awesome having those two names. So if I get it confused, I apologize for that. But Jeroboam's name is very interesting. His name translates to, uh, may the people be great, or may the people increase, you know? That's kind of like You know, for a king that's going to become a king to have the name of May the People Be Great, that's like, yeah, I like how that sounds. That sounds really good. Um, He is an Ephraimite. Uh, He's the son of Nabat, who apparently passed away. Uh, His mother's name was Zeruah. Um, She was a widow. Um, History also give us records that she was a harlot. So this, I'm sure this wasn't, you know, the easiest of childhoods to to be growing up in. Um, But he does come from a tribe that has a very rich history. Um, We know that Ephraim was, you know, 
the, the son of Joseph, which that was the preferred son of Jacob. So right off the bat, you're like, I'm from the tribe that is the real preferred son of Israel. Like, come on, yeah. Um, not only that, Joshua was uh, from Ephraim, and he was the one to succeed Moses. Uh, you have two judges that are, arose from Ephraim, and Deborah and Abdon, and one of my favorite Bible characters um, is just a normal guy. His name's Elkanah. He is actually of, <laughs> so his wife was Hannah, and they had Samuel, and that, you know, really started, the, he, like Samuel anointed the first two kings of Israel. So you have like a rich spiritual history for this nation, um, and someone that is coming from nowhere but has that, uh, that lineage, um, it's really impressive to see Jeroboam's life just from the, the, the viewpoint of us as men. Um, but we see that he rebels against the king. And in verse 27, and this is what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the millow and repaired the damages to the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the labor force of the house of Joseph. So you know, Jeroboam has this rough life, but he's an industrious man. He's a hard worker, and he catches the eye of, you know, this great builder in Israel. Solomon goes, man, look at this guy go. He is a mighty man of valor, which, you know, there weren't fighting enemies at this time. This was a time of peace. So Solomon sees him. He goes, this is awesome. Uh, we also know from history that Solomon's workforce was among some of the most intense <laughs> uh, times of labor, like no labor union at all. <laughs> it was just, uh, it was really rough because he had all these building projects. So he takes Jeroboam, he takes made the people be great, and he puts him over, you know, his own people to oversee the building projects. And we know that uh, the hard labor force to where he's over it, he's seeing his people, it's like, there, there's a reason to rebel there, to where, you know, the people aren't being great in this. The people are just building whatever Solomon wants, being taxed, you know, whatever they got to do. I don't like this. And we see that that's his rebellion right there. Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shiloh knight, met him on the way, and he had clothed himself with a new garment, and these two were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the people of Amnon. And they have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments, as did his father David. So, Ahijah, you know, they're just walking out in the field, and then suddenly he takes this brand new cloak and starts just ripping it up, and he's like, dude, what are you doing? And he goes, okay, this is what the Lord says. You're going to take ten pieces, and this represents ten tribes. So I'm going to leave one tribe, and you, you guys do the math, and you see that's only eleven. Well, really, Judah is also going to take... Benjamin with it, so there's, there's the 12. Um, but he s says, take 10 tribes, I'm going to tear it out of the hand of Solomon, because they have forsaken me. And this is kind of the unfortunate history of Israel, is as their leader went, so the people went with them, right? Um, so it wasn't enough just that Solomon, you know, was worshiping these false gods. The people followed in the same way with him. And I mean, Solomon built these wonderful buildings, right? So, you know, he's building these high places too, and, you know, that's a great wonder to the people, so of course they're going to go, huh, that building looks nice. Why don't I go over there and worship? Um, and it's a really sad thing. But as Jeroboam here is getting the promise that he's going to rule over ten tribes, God gives him the reason why. 
which I think there's a lot of times to which in our personal lives, you know, we, you know, we see God at work, we see God doing stuff, but then we say, okay, Lord, why do you do this? And there's silence, simply because we don't need to know. Here, God directly gives the why, and it's because it's supposed to be a safeguard. It's supposed to be a place for Jeroboam to dwell. And not only that, Jeroboam is given, (laughs) we're going to see that he's likened to King David. Continuing on into verse 34. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, because I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you, ten tribes, And to his son I will give one tribe, that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. So I will take you, and you shall reign over all your heart desires, and you shall be king over Israel. Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways, and do what is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. That is an impressive promise. I mean, you know, just thinking naturally here, if somebody came up and said, I'm going to make you king, you would be like, hoo yeah, I like how that sounds. Like, you know, when I got, I have this chair in my house, and you know, if you have the chair or your chair, that does make you feel kingly in your house. You're just like, oh yeah, I got my chair. Like, I know when I go over to mom and Matt's, Matt has a specific spot he sits in, and I like to sit there, but as soon as Matt comes in the living room, you know who vacates that spot? Me. (laughs) But you know, God's telling him, I'm gonna make you king. And it's like, all right, this is all you have to do. Walk with me. Keep my commandments. Be my servant. Walk in the ways that I have for you, just as David did. And I'm going to build you an enduring house. With, that, with the exception of David lacking someone, uh, David won't lack someone to sit on the throne for, uh, for, forever. This is the exact promise that God gave to David that he's giving to Jeroboam. That's awesome. I mean, our Lord is so great in that he comes and he visits us and he gives us great and awesome promises, great things that we can, you know, cherish, right? Here to Jeroboam, like, I'm going to make you king. Like, just walk in my ways. That's like, oh, this is awesome. There's more similarities here too. Um, Both David and Jeroboam are replacing disobedient kings, you know, they're like, if, if you had a job to which, you know, somebody else did this job and was arguably the best at their job, you would study their tendencies, right? Like, and Jeroboam is not that far removed from David. Um, so he could go back and he can examine, like, what was David's life like? You know, what did David do? It's like, David pr- provided all these materials for the temple, you know? David was hunted down by Saul wrongfully, and yet, you know, he never tried to attack attack Saul once. Like, all right, I got somebody to study after. I got, David loved the Lord. He was a man after God's own heart. Can I be like this? You know, Jeroboam has, uh, as he's being likened and given promises to David, he, he has some company to study. But not only that, I mean, God gave Jeroboam his word as the highest thing, you know, it's been faithful. It's been true. And, you know, he can, maybe he thinks Ahijah, he's like, you know what, Ahijah, you're crazy. I don't believe this has happened. But once it does happen, because we're going to see that it does, then that should be another time to be like, man, the Lord was so faithful to his word. I got to go back to it. Um, it's a really, really awesome and precious thing that Jeroboam has here. The Lord has invited him to be part of his work. I will afflict the descendants of David because of this, but not forever. And the the not forever is to remind us that, you know, the ultimate king to come was Jesus Christ. That, you know, there still is a responsibility to, to be following the word of God and worshiping accurately. The kingdom would have been divided between two kings, but it was supposed to still have one focal point of worship 
in Yahweh. Verse 40, Solomon therefore sought to kill Jeroboam. So Solomon somehow gets word of this and he goes, all right, you know what? Jeroboam's got to die. Which that puts Solomon in the same company as Saul and trying to, you know, murder the Lord's anointed. Which that's a really sad testimony on Solomon. Like, this, this is one of, <laughs> this is one of the, like, the greatest kings, uh, maybe in terms of prosperity and building projects in Israel. And here he is forsaking the Lord and trying to murder his anointed. Um, that's, it's super unfortunate. But it also gives Jeroboam another example of what not to follow. So I'm going to summarize these next sections because we could, like, there's so many Bible studies you could do in this, guys. So as you leave tonight, like, if you want homework, you have homework. Just go through uh, 1 Kings chapters 11 and 12 and just keep going on, study the kings and be like, wow. Or if, if you're studying all of Israel's kings, you'll be all, wow. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so Solomon dies, um, and he's buried to rest with his fathers, and Rehoboam, his son, reigns in his place. Uh, so Rehoboam goes to Shechem, which is a very important historical site in Israel, and all Israel comes there to anoint him as king. And uh, Jeroboam, who fled to Egypt, which that also gives us a little insight into who Jeroboam is. When things got tough, and this is kind of something that I've wrestled with because you know, David faithfully served Saul, right? You know, David was playing the heart for him, and Saul hucked spears at him, and, you know, after a couple times, David left the room. But then, you know, David faithfully came back and is playing the harp, and Saul hucks more spears at him, and he goes, okay, I think I'm looking for a new job. He asked Jonathan, and he ends up, you know, dwelling in the wilderness, and Saul is just chasing after him. And David has multiple times to where he could have killed Saul, but he doesn't because he would not bring his hand against the Lord's anointed. But right after the second time it happens, David goes, you know, one of these days Saul is going to catch me. So the best idea I'd have is to go live with the Philistines and serve them. But you're like, David, that is, that is not a good idea. The Philistines worship false gods and you've murdered their champion and well, not murdered, you killed them in battle, and you've defeated most of them. They're going to think it's really weird. Um, so David and Jeroboam have both been men of fear here. But one thing with Egypt, Egypt um, throughout the Old Testament is always a picture of the flesh. When, when a, someone of the nation of Israel goes to Egypt, it's simply because they're not trusting in the word of God. They're trusting in that which makes sense. So we see that Jeroboam kind of had not kind of, he has this uh, tendency to do. But he comes back for Rehoboam being inaugurated, and it's interesting to see because um, Jeroboam is one of these guys that comes up to Rehoboam and says, your father levied hardship on us. Your father made things hard for us. If you serve us, we will serve you. And that's pretty, that's pretty good advice for, you know, a king, like a prince that, you know, his dad was a king and his grandpa was a king. So arguably, this prince hasn't had a real hard life. <laughs> He's probably just lived it up and been like, oh, the hardest decision I'll have today is if I want to eat steak or if I want to eat steak. <laughs> so the people come and they say, hey, do this. And he goes, okay, that's a good idea. And then he listens to the elders who say, if you serve these people, they will be your people. And that's like, all right, yeah, cool. Um, another thing to note in that is those are good things to suggest to him, but what's ailing the nation at this moment? It's their idol worship. It's not that, you know, Solomon had mass taxes or a hard labor force. Solomon turned the entire nation's heart from worshiping Yahweh. The first demand that Jeroboam should have had, and in fact, he had the word of God which told him the way that you know, Rehoboam was to go, is, hey, you need to repent. <laughs> but you know what? Jeroboam acted what, what he thought was right. He acted in his namesake, and you know what? Let's make this people great. Let's make these people great again. Come on. Yeah, let's do this. No, the first thing they should have been is, we got a worship issue. 
We need to get right with the Lord. How can we say we're, our name is governed by God if we're over here worshiping the God of the Ammonites and the goddess of the Sidonians? But they don't do that. And Rehoboam, you know, doesn't take their advice. He goes to his young buddies uh, that are the same age as him, and they say, serve these people. No, you're the king. You need to rule. Show them that you're, you're the boss. And Rehoboam goes, yeah, I am the boss. So all the, nation, uh, all the tribes come back and they go, okay, Rehoboam, what are you going to do? And he says, you know, <laughs> my father disciplined you with scourge, scourges. I'm going to discipline you with scorpions, which is just a fancy translation for it. Even, like, I at first thought he was, like, had, like, like, genetically modified, like, scorpions, and I was like, there's no way he had this technology back then, but it's just a, it's just a term for a more intense scourge, so he was showing, like, I am the king, and instantly everybody was like, no, uh, what share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, David." Um, so Rehoboam is still like, whatever, these guys are going to try rebelling. He sends his tax collector to go collect taxes, and they kill him, and he quickly runs away. So this is where the nation is headed, and it's like, all right, well, what are we going to do next? Um, starting in verse 20, uh, hold on. Man, I lost my spot. <laughs> we'll start in verse 25. But in all this, they anoint Jeroboam as king over Jerusalem. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. And he went out from there and he built Penuel. So the first act Jeroboam has as king is to do what he naturally would do. Do what he's had a whole life of doing. And that he builds. You know, he goes to his hometown, or he goes to, to Shechem, and he decides this is going to be the capital. He builds and he fortifies it. And then he goes to Penuel, and he builds it there too, which you think, oh, that's really interesting. Your first act as king is to fortify this. And I think that also speaks to a heart that he's afraid. And there's a natural reason to be so, right? Like if you simply start a civil war, and you know what, you killed, your people killed the tax collector, and right before that, a war was about to break out, but a prophet comes up and says, don't do this. That's a pretty good reason to be fearful and be like, I need to fortify these cities. What's next is very sad. Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom may return to the house of David, which we have to stop there because... There is no reason that he should believe this. God's word said that Jeroboam would be king. That's all Jeroboam needs. God's word comes into our life and tells us how things are going to be. And we should take great comfort and refuge in that. And not only that, we should build our life around it. Our lives should be built on what God has said, what God has done, and what God has promised to do. God is faithful. What Jeroboam has here is an is a evil heart of unbelief, which we talked about fear, and fear is really interesting because everybody in this room has been afraid of something. Uh, I know in my household right now, one of the things that you know, we've been concerned with, and I'll, I'll say sometimes a little fearful, is seeing those big plumes of smoke and the fire and seeing all the updates to where it's captivating, but it's also striking, and it makes you a little scared. Um, fear is a natural thing. Um, fear is an emotion. Um, I always joke, if, and I'm, I use a lot of pop culture references in my studies, so I'm sorry. Um, but if you've seen that uh, Disney movie, Inside Out, that has all the little emotions like controlling the human, I always joke to my wife that, you know, um, fear and joy are probably the ones that are at the command desk the most. Um, because, you know, <laughs> we live in a world to, that, that gives us anxiety and fear. <laughs> the issue with that is fear should always be checked with the word of God. We're not to live our lives governed by fear. And not only that, fear is almost kind of a byproduct of pride. Um, we'll get more into this later. But Jeroboam says in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. 
If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord. Jeroboam, no. (laughs) This is exactly why the kingdom was torn out from Solomon's hands. He is going, you know what? It's too much for these people to go up to Jerusalem and worship the Lord there. If they keep doing this, they're going to go back. I'm not going to have the people. See, he's prideful as king, and he's like, these people are my people, but suddenly they're not going to be because they're worshiping correctly. They're worshiping the God who sent me up here. We can't have this be. (laughs) There's no reason for Jeroboam to do this other than the fact that, you know, he thinks the people are his people. May the people be great is more concerned with may the people be mine. And I think that's uh, very telling on what fear leads us to do. Um, fear, fear robs us of so much. Fear also puts us into positions that, that set us up to really walk contrary to a belief in God and his word. Therefore, the king asked advice made two calves of gold, and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, the exact words that Aaron said. (laughs) Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. It's like, Jeroboam, no, why would you do this? Ah, it's heartbreaking. Both David and Jeroboam were appointed by God to follow after disobedient kings, but we have one that actually followed after the Lord. We have one who decided to do it his way, and he did it out of fear, he did it out of pride, and God does not bless this reign. Moreover, just to to add some further layers to this, if you turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 11... starting in verse 13. And from all their territories, the priests and the Levites who were, win all, who were in all Israel took their stand with him, being Rehoboam, the king of Judah. For the Levites left their common lands and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had rejected them from serving as the priests of the Lord. Then he appointed for himself priests for the high place for the demons and the calf idols which he had made. And after the Levites left, those from all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord God of their fathers. So there were still those in Israel that were dwelling, and there are all the Levites that went, "Uh uh-uh, we're not doing this, Jeroboam. This is a mistake. This is a sin. We're not going to walk in this way. And he goes, all right, fine, be gone. But I'm going to make up my own false religion. (laughs) He set up one in Bethel, and he put the other in Dan. So he puts one really centrally, kind of in the south of the kingdom for people to go, and then he puts it at the furthest city in the north kingdom, these two calves. (laughs) Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel, he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar which he made at Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, which he had devised in his own heart, and he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. He had this fear, and he did everything within his own heart. You know, he, he had the fear, and he first was like, okay, well, we got to keep the children of Israel here, so let's make false gods for them. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Not only that, we'll make things look like they're actually worshiping back in Jerusalem. That's not a bad idea either. I'm going to make a day. We'll just pick, you know, Tuesday on this day, and perfect. They'll worship. Everything looks perfectly in order. I think when we do things out of fear, we could think that things are in order, but they are not. And I don't want it, I hope it's clear that I'm not saying if you're ever afraid, you are sinning, because that's farthest from the truth. 
I am always afraid of stuff. In fact, I would I have an admission to make that um, becoming a dad has made me a helicopter parent, which means anywhere that Joshua is run into in our house, I am pretty much hovering right over him, making sure he doesn't fall and hit his head. You know, I want everything to be perfect for my boy. I'm afraid of what's going to happen to him. But you know what that really robs me of? Just getting to play with my son. You know what fear robs me of? The hope and the trust I have in a faithful God. These are things that should not govern, govern our life. That was one question I got a lot as a youth pastor, was I'd have a parent come up to me and say, Justin, what are you doing to, you know, combat the wiles of, well, first off, like, I'm not combating anything. <laughs> like, I'm just an instrument here. But like, what are you doing? Because the world is just a crazy place, right? Everything is fearful. Our kids are not set up to uh, be successful. It's like, the Lord has set us up for an abundant success in the things that matter. The Lord has set us up to be true worshipers of him, to have true fellowship with one another, to share his gospel with a world that desperately needs it. We are set up for success, but being fearful makes it, turns it around, and we just go, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen to our nation. I don't know either, but my hope is always in Jesus Christ. I don't know, you know, what'll hap happen to, you know, if, God forbid, if something happens to me, what happens to my family? I don't know, but they faithfully love the Lord. The Lord will take care of them. I think that needs to be a prevailing message for these times, is that, you know, we do not operate in a place of fear. And I, I think Joey... Uh, vaguely, not vaguely, he touched on it on Sunday. I don't, I just don't have the right word to say how he touched on it. But, you know, fear is not, <laughs> fear is not our ruler. Jesus Christ is. God's word gives us a hope. God's word is tested and true. God's word is faithful. That is the, that is the, uh, the great solution to all our fears in this present, present age. And it's unfortunate that Jeroboam didn't, didn't, you know, first take his, his cares and anxieties to the Lord. Because the Lord would have faithfully met him with, I will perform my word just as I have spoken. And that's important for us to remember in our lives, is that God will complete his word perfectly. There is nothing to fear. Uh, I... Uh, there's one quote um, from Jim Elliot, um, which I, I really like Jim Elliot. I've never read any of his original stuff, but I, ha but I have read his biography and a lot of stuff that Elizabeth Elliot wrote. Um, and, you know, he's, he's given the famous quote of, uh, you know, he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. Which when I say it out loud, I have to really think about it a couple times because again, I am not the wisest man in the world. But basically, <laughs> if you give away what you can't keep <laughs> for that which you'll keep for all eternity, and that is Jesus Christ, you're not a fool. Jeroboam was a fool because he sacrificed, you know, an enduring kingdom, <laughs> fellowship with the Lord, just for simply, you know, these people are mine. Don't let it be so in your life. That if there's anything in your life that you're really afraid to lose, just bring it to the Lord and just let his word just, you know, guide you perfectly. Let's pray. Lord, thank you just for not giving us a spirit of fear. Um, just that, you know, we can rest in the love that you have for us. We can rest in the grace and peace you have freely given of us. And whenever we do have a fear, we can all, or an anxiety, or any type of care, Lord, we can always take it to your feet and just wait for you to meet it. Um, Lord, thank you so much for how you love us, how you serve us. And really, because of those things, we want to serve you. We want to obey your word. We want to continue to walk in, in your ways. And we want to share your gospel with a world that desperately needs it. 
I just pray just that, um, you know, even in my own life, for the things that I'm fearful of, just that I would always rest on your word and go to your word. That, you know, my fears don't need to be addressed by my solutions right away. My fears always will first be taken to you and see what your solution is. And even if you're, you're silent, Lord, I know that means I can be silent. You are perfect in all of your ways and you are good, and we just thank you for that. We thank you for that even in this age to where, you know, we're surrounded by <laughs> turmoil and anxiety, just that your word still speaks clearly to us and perfectly governs us. And we just ask that we would be wholly submitted over to that. Uh, Lord, we just lift up the, the fire. Um, we just ask that you be keeping um, the first responders and those affected by the fire safe. Um, we know that, you know, at your word, the fire could cease, and we know that you supply all wisdom, so we just ask for those that are battling the fire, just that you would give them strength and wisdom, extra measures of grace and peace, and just at your word, Lord, we just ask that you would just have the fire to cease. Um, bring, bring people home and uh, show yourself strong in their lives. Lord, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.